I'm Dana Sostegger. After three decades in the marketing business and many years of being an entrepreneur, I've learned a thing or two about marketing. Join me as we talk about marketing, small business, and life in between. Welcome to My Weekly Marketing. Hello and welcome to another episode of My Weekly Marketing. Today, you're in for a treat. If you feel like you've hit a a ceiling in your income or feel stuck in your business, you may have hired a coach or applied some strategies and tactics that you've read about. But what you might really have going on is a financial block. Camille Walker is a speaker, trainer, and experienced attorney and consultant. She works with purpose-driven entrepreneurs and sales teams to increase their revenue without overworking them so they can achieve their goals and enjoy more free time. Camille helps to pinpoint and release subconscious blocks and sabotaging patterns for performance breakthroughs. Good stuff, right? I think you're really going to enjoy what Camille has to say. Here we go. Good morning, Camille. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, Good morning, Janice. So tell me about your business and what you do. Well, so I help um, mostly course creators Um, I call it creative professional entrepreneurs who are service-based to actually enhance their performance and um, in helping them, the the way I help them is I help them get clear on where they have blind spots and beliefs and barriers that are keeping them from performing optimally. So in other words, you would be making more money, but there are these things that are getting in your way. And so I help you release those and get clear so that you can achieve your goals with ease. So that is what I've been doing for the since 2018. That is really interesting. It's kind of an interesting pivot, um, I think, because you were you're an attorney as well. Is that correct? correct. So tell me how about how tell me how about tell me about how you got into this from where you were. Okay, so It was interesting working with clients, um, business clients or clients that were professionals, and they would come in with a legal challenge, most of the time not pleasant, right, around having to restructure debt, or in some cases, people contracted like illnesses that kept them from working or a break in their family relationship, so they go through a divorce. And so I call those transitions. And what I started to see is there were those people that would go through those transitions and they would come back stronger, um, start new businesses, start new lives. And then there were other people that for some reason, they could not get back on their feet. And so a lot of it had to do with what they were thinking, how they were thinking. And so it got me really interested in what in us, right, keeps us going and how do we really look at challenges and obstacles so that we can rebuild our lives. So long story short, I'm observing other people go through it, through this, but at the same time, I decided to start a consulting company where I was doing transformational work, helping people start businesses, get back on their feet with monetizing what was their expertise. And as I started to do it myself, I found my own blocks and beliefs that were getting in the way. So here was I understood how to create a business, what needed to be done. Actually, I have a whole lifetime of experience. But what I found is there were beliefs in me that were keeping me from fully showing up in my business. So I was having a hard time with sales. I was having a hard time with visibility. I was having a hard time just really being organically me. And that's what got me to go up. No, wait a minute. There's something going on here. And now it's me. So I began to look into um, the mindset and what it takes and how there are subconscious beliefs inside of us that are actually more powerful than our conscious mind. In other words, you can decide, I want to start this business. And I know what I'm doing. I've been trained. I have all the right tools, but there could still be a part of you that's not in agreement with what you're doing and it will block you. So that's how I got into the work. 
Oh, that's really interesting. So talk to me about the blocks, um, specifically in income or making sales, or I mean, tell me more about where they come from or, or how do you know if you have them? Okay. Well, there's certain symptoms. Let's talk about the symptoms. You know how when we have a health condition, there's usually a symptom that precedes it. So Mm -hmm. if you say you're very competent at what you do, like you're capable, you've been trained, um, but you see that you still aren't able to make the money that you desire. For some reason, your income just doesn't match your effort and you can't figure out why. You've got all your marketing, your strategies, maybe you even have a coach. For some reason, it still doesn't make sense why you can't get your income to go past a certain level. That's one symptom. Another symptom would be you get you get things going and things go really good for a while. And then all of a sudden it's kind of feast or famine. You're on a roller coaster. So you're able to go. But at the same time, you're up, then you're down. That's another symptom. The third symptom could be, you know, every time I get to a certain level of income, something always happens catastrophically, say, the car breaks down or there's medical expenses or something always comes up, right? Something always happens is what I hear that lets you know some expense to kind of take away the steam from what you're doing. Those are typically um, something's getting in your way and those are the things that are blocks. And so you have to dig into where do those come from? So second part of your question is what's interesting is it's all coming from inside of you. So we have a conscious mind and that's what I'm talking to you with, right? Consciously, I know I'm talking to you and I'm deciding what I'm going to say, but there's an unconscious part of you that's your memory bank. And it remembers everything that has ever happened in your life. So if you've had any say childhood conditioning from your parents, like, Um, For some people that I work with, they can still hear the voice of their parents saying, you'll never amount to anything, or you can't do that, or people like us don't do that. Those Those are blocks and those are conflicts in your belief system. Consciously, you're believing you can, but you have another memory that's controlling the saying you can't, or we can't, or people like us don't. So which one do you think is more powerful? Oh, I'm sure that our, our, our background, I mean, it dictates who we are today and especially in those formative years, right? Right. And so that's what you find is it's childhood conditioning, culture conditioning sometimes, or negative past experiences you've had, such as with my legal clients. Um, say you go through a period where, and this really started happening back with the last economic crisis that I was a part of, where I was practicing law, where a lot of the tech companies um, they went out of business. They lost funding. They weren't able to continue. And so that's a that's called a traumatic experience. So because of that, it affected um, your confidence, right? <laughs> they lost their businesses. They had to pivot. Um, or it could be personally, you've gone through, say, a, a divorce where you had to divide up assets or a business failure or um, anything traumatic around money gets stored in your memory bank as some level of a block. Now, it doesn't always affect you, but for most people, they'll find there's one or two, maybe three big things in their life that they're not aware of that's in the memory bank, that's trying to get your attention. And when it does, it blocks your ability to sell or it blocks your ability to really show up well in your business, I want to say. When that Mm -hmm. happens, you're not making the money that you really want to make. Yeah, I have so many questions for you right now. This this is so interesting. Um, So it it this is not necessarily things that happen when we're children. This could be things that happen early in our career or in, even into adulthood. What um what do you suppose the best thing to do is if you say had a business that failed early on in your career? 
um, which many of us do. Like I, I, my first business did not go well and I learned a lot, but what is it that we can do when we have those experiences that will keep us um, going in the right direction so that we don't let these turn into blocks for us or, or is there nothing we can do? Well, the first thing is, of course, to be aware that there are some experiences in your past that have been pretty traumatic and they have an emotion attached to them. So um, that's how I knew. I mean, going back to what happened to me is, you know, I've been dealing with other people's traumatic experiences in my law practice for years, but I didn't recognize I have a lot of traumatic experiences growing up. So my dad was an entrepreneur and he did well in the beginning of his business, but he bought another business and it went through a traumatic event where we had to close the business. And I had to do that. I had to wrap up the business. I had to lay off employees. I had to find a job. And I thought, okay, this is just what I do. I know how to do this. I didn't think anything of it. So the truth is when I was starting this new consulting company, all of a sudden, all of that stuff came back and I pinpointed. So the first thing is you have to pinpoint where in your experience you're having the block because it could be anything it could be from your childhood it can be from a traumatic event in your past or it can be from a value conflict you have um i didn't realize i had a value conflict with money Mm -hmm. yeah i ask you you know i want to ask your listeners um what's your relationship like with money um, and when I ask that question, people always look at me like, what do you mean? I, I don't have a relationship with money. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. I had a coach that that pointed this out in me and in all of us, I think, do. And it, we all grow up with messages like money doesn't grow on trees or it, you need to work hard to earn it or or. You know, they're they're just messages that are part of our culture, not even if it wasn't part of your home growing up. It's certainly part of the culture. And and as we get out on our own and we have, you know, no money early on, (laughs) we learn to um, associate meaning with that as well. Um, So I people have issues when they grow up with less money than others. Um, I found that I have guilt when I have more money than other people like I remember um, several years ago, we bought a, a, a nice new house. It was beautiful. It was more bedrooms than we needed. And how much guilt I need, I had when I'd walk through that house and thinking, I mean, this is more than we need. I shouldn't have all this, you know? And, and I see that playing out in my own business. It's like, when I think back to how I price things, I think, well, okay, what would it be making in corporate America? Well, that's sort of where I should be. You know, so I don't want to price myself too high, um, you know, and I get in my own way. I don't know if that's a common thing, too, where you see that people actually feel bad about having money or making money or being successful. You just hit a trigger. So that's where my story started. Um, I grew up in a small community. And um, my dad was pretty progressive, by the way. I mean, he did, he's not college educated, but he was just a person who would resource himself and re- he read a lot and he wanted to start a business. And so when he started to do well, I lived in a community where everybody else worked on a job. And so they have fixed incomes, right? Well, as he started to do well and we had more, we'd go on vacation. And then he and his brother had a business at the time and they bought a boat. And back then, I know it's nothing now, but it was a big deal. Oh, my God, you've got a boat. So as we started to obtain some of the toys or enjoy some of the things of life that my dad wanted us to enjoy, I felt guilty. And I actually got teased about, Mm -hmm. in fact, I remember one of my friends asked me, are you all rich? I mean, and I was startling. I'm like, no, we're not rich. My dad just works hard. No, I'm not. I mean, I remember that moment like yesterday because that was one of my blocks where I said, no, we're not rich. We just work hard like everybody else. Well, that began kind of the belief system that I continued to nurse throughout my life. We work hard. 
We work for money, but we're not rich. And when you start nursing those belief systems, guess what happens? When you get to a certain level, your mind says, okay, that's enough, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have enough. You you don't need to go here because you already have enough. And that's what happened is I was in my law practice. I felt good about helping people, but there were times where I felt guilty about how much I had to charge to help them. Mm -hmm. But but it was pretty standard that you charge a certain amount per hour. And so I could do nothing about that. But when I started this new consulting business and then I can set the price, guess what? As I sat the price and I realized the value was at a certain level, I felt guilty about charging. And what Mm -hmm. happened is I charge a while and then all of a sudden something would happen. And I saw that in my clients that they weren't able to own the value of the services they were provided. They weren't able to sustain at that level because they were making more than enough. And so something would happen and they go feast or famine or some catastrophic event, or they feel guilty, and then they sabotage themselves with a behavior. And one of the behaviors that shows up is procrastination. Hmm. That's a big one. Yeah, that's a symptom. And then the second one is perfectionism. Like, I have to be perfect if I'm charging this level of money, right? So those go hand in hand. So I'd see that a lot. Like, I've got to get ready to get ready to start. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> I have. And, you know, you, you, you're you talking to me right now. I mean, it's the, that perfectionism gets in the way so often. And um, I, I know the lean approach is 80% and just go with it, you know, but I have a hard, hard time with that. It's, if you have that belief that you have to earn the money and you have to work hard at it and you have to be perfect at it, you never really get there. There's this in the ceiling that you keep raising yourself. And so pretty soon you're not doing anything except overworking and undercharging, which is pretty common. Yes. So the yes. people I work with are typically driven uh, entrepreneurs who are overworking and which really makes you undercharging and then they burn out but they want to go to the next level, but they feel guilty about that. So what we have to do is get to the point where we, first of all, pinpoint where in your experience are those conflicts, those blocks, then we have to release them. And so there's a process to that because I thought it was just consciously, I could just change my mind and say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Well, that didn't work because That's consciously what I want, but subconscious is saying, "Mm -mm, we're not going to do that. We're not going to make a certain amount of money. It's not safe to make a certain amount of money. It's not seen. I mean, you don't want to be seen as greedy. Mm -hmm. You want to continue to stay under the radar and not make too much because people will not misunderstand you and be jealous of you and it's not safe. And so... Until I could get to the bottom of those beliefs, and that's what I do. That's the work that I do. So um, there are many ways to see the problem, but to fix the problem, you really have to get into the subconscious part of where you are and rewrite that program like you would a program on a computer. Like, hey, we've got something here. This code doesn't belong here. We've got to rewrite the code. And we have to do that and we have to constantly, you know, do repetition with the new program, which is if it's not safe to make money because you're ashamed of making money, then you have to write a new program. It's perfectly healthy. It's perfectly um, in line with your beliefs to impact more people. So you take it away from the money piece and make it about impact. So I've done that with my clients where we rewrite your code in such a way that it's not in conflict with some of the resistance that you have. So when you think about impacting more people, just think about how that feels versus 
I'm going to make more money and I'm going to double my income. That is so powerful. And and that's really what I, I've had to do too. Anytime that we, you know, get into a situation where we're nervous or unsure of ourselves, oftentimes we know what to do. It's just that suddenly we realize that other people are either looking at us or making a judgment about us. And to break away from that, take some practice and say, yeah. okay, I need to refocus my energy here on what, how I can help this person or what I can say in front of this group of people as I'm speaking. Right. The minute that gets broken, then you just kind of start choking. I think, uh, you know, we, we, it, it takes, it, it, our, I, it takes our eye off the ball, so to speak. Yeah. Um, we make it about us. And so for me in 2018, I was making it about me. I was showing up in that that ball of energy that said, don't look at me. It's not safe for you to look at me. And if you do, then I'm already perceiving what you think about me. So you see how it was all about me as opposed to I'm right. showing up now in service to those that are listening. And while I am, like I say, I'm still the introvert. I'm still the person that doesn't like to be on camera or speak in public, but this message is so important to me that no entrepreneur will ever have a reason to think there's something wrong with me. Because as you know, the statistics are with small businesses, many of them go out of business after three years, not because they're not really good at what they do, but they run out of cash. And Mm -hmm. most of the statistics for the reason for that is, oh, you know, the seen reasons, but no one talks about the unseen reasons that are so much stronger than your intentions to succeed. So I think by doing this work and for entrepreneurs to say, along with building the business and getting the marketing and learning how to sell, that you have to learn how to manage your emotions and your mindset in order to go hand in hand. And when you do that, miracles happen, I call it. It looks like like all of a sudden, you know, you're free to actually create and do the things that you've wanted to do a long time. And so I've been able to do that with with my clients and, and they're just now so happy with just getting to serve at a higher level and being able to identify when they have this resistance now what to do when you have it, and when to ask for help. Like Mm -hmm. we're so used to doing things on our own. We don't want to ask for help. We we don't want to appear to need help. But this Mm -hmm. is the kind of help that a lot of people are not aware of about as much as mine. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I say this in marketing all the time is, is that people have a hard time assessing their own marketing because they're too close to it. And that's got to be definitely the case with this. You really need somebody with fresh eyes that can look at you from the outside and say, OK, I see where you're struggling here. This is what you need to do next. But um, I'm going to back up just a little bit, too, because I, I, I you have a download on your site that I went through it, which is really fascinating. Um that talked about uh, some of the common blocks we have. And um, one of them, um, you talked about the belief of that I am not enough. And I I see this a lot in women, um, especially like I was a stay-at-home mom for a few years. I, I got out of the career path for a few years. And, and during that time, I became a volunteer and I was active with my kids and I was on the floor. And somehow my self-esteem of that professional person that I was kind of just drop lower, 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 lower. And so I see this in other women who were in that same boat where they um, weren't necessarily working full time and they just kind of lost that, that edge that they had when they were in their career. And, and we start believing like, I'm just this, or I, I only know this, um, you know, how, what do you, how do you get past something like that? Well, it's very common. You you think it's just stay-at-home moms. It's really the busy professional, too. Um, When you're wearing a certain, I call it uniform, like 
executive uniform or sales uniform or stay at home or firefighter, whatever the uniform is, when you think of yourself that way, that's how you see yourself. And so when you take the uniform off, you don't know who you are, right? Right. You yeah, know, who am true. I? Not enough, right? So the first thing I always have people do is look inside themselves and tell me, you know, where we find your brilliance and it's your organic brilliance. Like when we were born, I believe we got a download of brilliance and it's up to us to figure out what that is outside of what you choose to do. So while I am a lawyer I provide legal services. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a Camille. What's inside of me? So mm -hmm. discover who you are without any uniform first. Because right. if you don't, you may lose the ability to have that uniform. You know, I think you're absolutely right in, in that we, you know, we get out of school or we, you know, we, we enter the work world and we immediately start identifying with our job title you know, who we are as a lawyer, as a consultant or whatever. And when that's taken away, we're somehow left without a sense of purpose or a sense of identity. Um, and by the way, I have, I, I don't want to think that I am in any way disparaging that stay at home moms. I think they do a, a great, important job. I'm just talk, kind of talking about how I viewed myself during that time, which was obviously not good. <laughs> and it didn't do me any favors. But um, you also wrote in there, um, fear was trying to keep me safe from embarrassment and possible failure. Uh, I think this is a common issue among all of us. I, I, I can't think of anybody that hasn't been embarrassed or, or um, you know, been afraid at some point in their life. How is that something that people can get past? Well, first of all, it just really starts with a decision. Um, a decision that, again, it's not about me, um, but it is about practicing and being okay with being embarrassed. So that wasn't something I was willing to do because, again, I, you're conditioned not to make mistakes or you were in my profession. Like, it's costly to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I had to recognize where that was coming from. And it was costly growing up not to make mistakes because I was a perfectionist, Right. And so I commonly see that with women, um, that we grow up trying to be something and not allowing ourselves to redefine mistakes. Mistakes are opportunities to get better. So you right. have to like know you've got that. I call it dis-ease in your life. It is a dis-ease. <laughs> and you have to be willing to make the decision. I'm going to go on this podcast. And I'm going to be embarrassed. That's what we're going to do, Camille. And it's safe to be embarrassed. So you can do some tapping. I don't know if you've heard of EFT around. It's safe to be embarrassed. It's safe to make mistakes. It means that you're getting better. And after you start redefining that, then pretty soon you're not embarrassed anymore. Maybe I don't pronounce my words properly. Maybe... Um, something goes wrong with technology, but you're willing to be embarrassed. And the person who's the most willing to be embarrassed wins the prize. I love that. I love That's that. what success is. <laughs> oh, yeah. The um, man in the arena, I think, is the, um, the, the term I've used. The person that's got the courage enough to get out in the middle of the arena and make mistakes in front of everybody and and be ridiculed. Um you know, they, they deserve their respect at the end of the day. So let's say we've identified our blocks. What's the next step for people? So again, the awareness is not enough. So we have to release um, the blocks. So once we release those, it's about removing the emotional trigger. So for instance, if money is evil, right, and you have that, and most people say, oh, I don't believe that. But if you've had some conflicts with money, if you've lost your business, like um, some of my clients had partnerships that went south, so money became an issue. So anytime you've got that traumatic thing, then you may have that belief that money is evil. It caused problems, right? Mm -hmm. So you 
got an emotion attached to that, you have to identify what that emotion is because it's not the belief is bad enough, but the emotion that's holding you back in place with that may be like anger, um, resentment, frustration, or despair with some people. And so you have to identify those emotions and we have to, I call it, remove the triggers that go with those. Because if you don't, we're energy and everything we're doing, when we show up in our business, it's our energy that's showing up, the essence of who we are. So if I have an energy and you see I'm, you can't see it, but it's anger, it's frustration, it's resentment and all of those things, that's what you're transferring to your clients. So we have to identify the emo- not only the belief system, but also the emotions and disarm those triggers. That's the second part of it. And then the third part is really establishing a new identity. So no longer am I a business owner or the consultant or the whatever you say you are, the social media expert. My identity is more or less what would a person have to be to be successful at whatever they're attempting to do? First of all, you have to learn to see yourself as a problem solver. Not just a business owner, a problem solver. And so what would a problem solver do? They would understand the needs of their clients, right? They would get into the heads of their clients. But you would do that with certain successful characteristics that we all have to train for. And that is the most common thing is commitment to do the work, the internal work, right? Um, Being diligent about that and then being disciplined. So many times when we identify, especially on the mindset side of things, what we need to do and how those three steps are what people need to do, they'll work on their business all day long right? They'll, they'll work on their website. They'll do their mm-hmm. social media. Oh, they'll do, they'll push papers and write copy. But when there's mindset exercises to help you rebuild your identity, not even get around to that. That's not really important, right? When really it's more important than what you do. So establishing an identity is about who you're being. Who you're being is more important than what you're doing. <laughs> Love that. This is golden. How can people find out more about what you do? And, and um, you have a free download on your site. You have a couple of them, I think. Tell us more about those. Well, the first thing is always to get a kind of look at your self-diagnosis um, to see where there's some problems. I think you downloaded that camillewalker.com forward slash sales blocks. Go there. Down, do that download and actually really look at where you might be stuck. Um, and also for people who will go that extra step, and here's where most people stop. They'll look at the download and go, yeah, I see it. I see it. And that's another block. When you think you know that and that you can fix it yourself, that's the first block. But the second part is you have the opportunity to connect with me after that. If you download it, do it. Collect, I mean, set up a 30 minute, what I call a blind spot breakthrough call, because I can see things that you can't. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things I discovered about my own brilliance is there's a reason that I have the training as a lawyer that I can pinpoint issues. I can find problems that most people don't see and can't see. And so take advantage of that. Like, Who wouldn't take advantage? Well, I'd say 80% of people will go to that site, download it, see it, listen to this and go, this is great, but they won't take that next step. And it's part of that procrastination and part of that fear of being seen. So that's really um, the most important step you could take to break through. That's why I've been named the, the breakthrough queen. Um, break through your blocks so that you can um, achieve your goals easier and impact more people. You're right. I think as business owners, we, we want to see 
the numbers. We want to see the um, tangible parts of it. These seem almost like soft skills, but they're so crucial, especially if you've got a personal brand or if you're a solopreneur. It's so important to get past these because you're right, they will jeopardize your entire business. Right. And you'll call it just fate. You know, you'll say, oh, it just happened to me. Look what happened to me. Mm -hmm. No, it's not just what happened to you. It's happening from inside of you. So that's why, James, thank you so much, because you can see why I'm so passionate about this work. I did not set out to be a do this work. I fell into this work, honestly, first of all, seeing and observing it in others then identified in myself and getting the help that I needed. And I purposed after that, that no one else would have to suffer in silence. I love this. Thank you very much. You've been really insightful. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can get Camille's free sales block breakthrough guide in the show notes at myweeklymarketing.com forward slash six. If you found this content helpful, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'd be so grateful. Thank you and see you next time. Bye for now.